Hello, everybody, and thank you for joining us today. I am thrilled to be uh, meeting up with some of my favorite luminary minds to talk to you about this extraordinary book by Derek Scott. Uh, I wanted to start by thanking Robin Pierce and Mark Abzid uh, of the Othering and Belonging Institute for helping us organize this event. Everybody who's organized a Zoom event knows it's far more complicated than you could ever imagine. So we're grateful for this space and this technology. Just to give people a little picture of what's gonna happen today, um, I'm gonna give an introduction to everybody that's on the panel and I'm gonna celebrate and lift up Derek Scott and his contributions. Uh, Derek is gonna do a short reading from the book. We'll have a panel discussion between all of us and then we'll open it out into Q and A. I wanna encourage the audience since we can't see you to feel free to drop comments and questions um, throughout the discussion. And there will be a moment when we'll start to try to collect some of those questions and, uh, and answer them for you as best as we can. Uh, so thank you again for joining us. Uh, to give you a little introduction of myself, and then I'll speak about each of our amazing um, panelists. I'm a professor of English at the University of Wisconsin-Madison. I'm the author of two books, The New Mutants, Superheroes, and the Radical Imagination of American Comics, and more recently, Queer Forms, which is forthcoming from NYU Press this fall. Uh, and I, were, I had the great pleasure of working with Derek on co-editing a special issue of American literature titled Queer About Comics, uh, which we were very fortunate to have win uh, the Best Special Issue of the Year Award from the Council of Editors of Learned Journals in 2019. Rebecca Wanzo is professor and chair of the Department of Women, Gender, and Sexuality Studies at Washington University in St. Louis. She's the author of The Suffering Will Not Be Televised, African-American Women and Sentimental Political Storytelling, and more recently, the, the content of our caricature, African-American comic art and political belonging, which examines how black cartoonists have used racialized caricatures to criticize constructions of ideal citizenship, as well as the alienation of African-Americans from such imaginaries, a beautiful award-winning book. She has published in numerous academic venues, such as American Literature, Camera Obscura, and Signs, and also writes essays for media outlets like CNN, the LA Review of Books, and Huffington Post. Jonathan Gray is Associate Professor of English at John Jay College CUNY and the CUNY Graduate Center. He is the author of Civil Rights in the White Literary Imagination and is currently working on the book project Illustrating the Race, Representing Blackness in American Comics, which traces depictions of African-Americans in comics from 1966 to the present by investigating how the twin notions of illustration, the creative act of depiction on the one hand and the political act of bringing forth for public consideration on the other function in these texts. Professor Gray co-edited the essay collection Disability in Graphic Novels for Palgrave Macmillan and formerly served as the founding editor of the Journal of Comics and Culture. Michael Mark Cohen is an associate teaching professor in the American Studies and African American Studies programs at UC Berkeley. He is the author of The Conspiracy of Capital, Law, Violence, and American Popular Radicalism in the Age of Monopoly which is a cultural history of popular anti-capitalist movements, conspiracy laws, and political violence in the United States during the age of monopoly. He is also the creator of the website Cartooning Capitalism, which hosts the work of Arthur Henry Young, the most widely recognized and beloved cartoonist of the golden age of American radicalism. So I think it's fair to say that we have an incredible brain trust here of comics scholars uh, and cultural studies scholars. And now to our main event. Uh, Derek Scott is professor in the Department of African American Studies at UC Berkeley and the author of the newly published Keeping It Unreal, Black Queer Fantasy and Superhero Comics, which we're really excited to celebrate with you today. And I'm, in a moment, I'm gonna say a few words about this brilliant book. Professor Scott is also the author of Extravagant Abjection, Blackness, Power and Sexuality in the African American Literary Imagination which examines representations and theorizations of the relation between blackness, abjection, and queer masculinity, a book that is so counterintuitive, innovative, and, and uh, shocking in its arguments, it totally transforms my graduate students. Alongside his highly original scholarship, he is also the author of the novels Hex 
and Traitor to the Race, and the editor of Best Black Gay Erotica. His fiction has appeared in the anthologies Freedom in This Village, Black Like Us, Giant Steps, among others, as well as in the erotica collections Flesh and the Word. Um, uh, and inside him. He has published essays in Callaloo, GLQ, and the, and the collection Gay Travels, among many other venues. So before we get started, I want to say a couple of words about keeping it unreal. Keeping it unreal is many things. It is a loving journey through Black radical imagination, an invitation into the creative life world of the author and his complex and rich attachments to the superhero genre, and a study of the formal affordances of the comics medium for articulating black presence and agencies, an agency. But perhaps most of all, it is an impassioned plea for the value of fantasizing, not as an escape from our shared world, but as a deep commitment to its transformation into something better, a place where human difference is no longer a source of suffering, but a wellspring of creative possibility. In the past decade, scholarship on Black speculation and utopia has exploded, most notably with the expansive study of Afrofuturism. Keeping it unreal honors this tradition, but it breaks new ground by conceiving fantasy not merely as a genre, an object of study, but a state of being or cognitive practice grounded in the human capacity for imagination. So it takes the study of Black fantasy into the realm of existential experience, which is Derek's uh, his great uh, skill for, uh, for thinking about Black fantasy as a mode of living. In keeping with his magisterial and innovative oeuvre, these are counterintuitive claims that he makes in the book that can only come from a generous mind, one open to the possibilities others shut out, one demanding we think what it, rethink what it means to be free, one that requires an unflinching look at forms of abjection as lived experiences that can vitalize complex responses and unexpected avenues of survival. So ultimately, keeping it unreal gives us meaningful hope for a different future, neither by merely recuperating a genealogy of Black speculative fictions, nor adding to the interminable and painful list of Black historical trauma, but by reminding us that we still have the power of invention in our grasp in the present. So thank you all for joining us. Uh, I'm really excited to get this conversation going. But first, Derek um, is going to read for us from the book. Thank you, Ramsey. I love hearing your reading of my book, and I uh, appreciate that that uh, gloss on it. Um, also, I want to give warm thanks to, um, to Rebecca, Jonathan, and Michael for participating in this panel with me and celebrating my book today. Uh, talking with you guys and reading your work over the years about comic books has enriched my understanding and contributed to my getting this book done. So thank you. Um, thanks also to Robin Pierce and the Other and Belonging Institute for putting this event together. And thank you all for attending. Um, so I'm gonna read uh, a short excerpt from the introduction to the book. Um, and this is uh, just a little piece of, of what I'm discussing in the beginning. Ursula K. Le Guin's provocative story, The Ones Who Walk Away from Omelas, is probably most often read as a discomforting riddle about the morality of utilitarianism. Omelas is a fantasy city or country where everyone lives happily. Unfortunately, this universal happiness depends upon the lifelong misery of one child. The causal relationship between the child's unhappiness and everyone else's commonplace ecstasy is never explained in the story, but arguably it's all the more convincingly realistic for its lack of explanation. Surely we expect happiness to be bought by someone's misery. No explanation needed, an assumption Le Guin cleverly begins to expose. But what gets me excited about the story is the challenge it throws down to our imagination. Describing Omelas, Le Guin's narrator says, as they did without monarchy and slavery, so they also got on without the stock exchange, the advertisement, the secret police, and the bomb. Yet I repeat that these were not simple folk, no dulcet shepherds, noble savages, bland utopians. They were not less complex than us. The trouble is that we have a bad habit, encouraged by pedants and sophisticates, of considering happiness as something rather stupid. Only pain is intellectual, only evil interesting. This is the treason of the artist, a refusal to admit the banality of evil and the terrible boredom of pain. If you can't lick them, join them. If it hurts, repeat it. 
But to praise despair is to condemn delight. To embrace violence is to lose hold of everything else. We have almost lost hold. We can no longer describe a happy man nor make any celebration of joy. Le Guin's narrator's claim about the treason of art is too harsh if I take it up and make it into a critique of African-Americanist scholarship and intellectual endeavor. But it's not wholly inapt. Certainly regarding what we canonize and teach under the rubric African-American literature, the description has a ring of truth. For a literature defined by the near unanimity of its voices agitating, analyzing, narrating, and narrativizing political projects of emancipation and anti-racism, too great an attention to delight and joy and happiness seems a political betrayal. For us, only the description of the grave injustices of anti-Blackness, of torture, murder, intimidation, enslavement, rape, dispossession is political, is exigent, and is real. Yes, of course, we can recognize and take seriously representational and analytical strategies of humor and satire, descriptions of resistant cultural practices, locations of temporary marronage. But who has described without irony or shame a black happy person? In the light of harsh realities, who has the time? Who has the right? I'm so accustomed to investigating, if not exactly praising despair, pain, and evil, that if a description of black happiness appeared somewhere, I probably missed it or didn't pay attention to it. And if it appeared somewhere, it was a challenge to the very conception of black literature. What it is, how it must be structured to, structured to be recognized as black literature, its justification and use, its distinction from mere luxury. And so it didn't count. The happiness Le Guin's treasonous artist cannot summon the intellect or interest to engage is for the black writer a foolishness we often can't afford to indulge. Black fantasy, as I'm thinking about it then, might be aimed at snatching luxury where, as best we can see at any rate, there is none. It might be indulgent, foolish, frivolous, merely escapist, naively utopian, in some way wrong, inattentive to the real, defiant of the realist. Fantasy is generally understood on balance to be above all a misperception, straying from accurate perception, and also therefore a misstep on the pathway to the correction of a problem, which obviously has to be accurately perceived in order to be solved. I'm interested in this book in a reconstruction of the account of fantasy in its relationship to blackness. I wanna think of how fantasy engages and yet sidesteps the real problem that we think it poorly addresses. Viewed properly, my investigation is not a fantasy as critique of the real, though fantasy does offer such critiques. My investigation, my fantasy about fantasy, is a fantasy as a mode of living and fantasy as a transformation of living and being. The argument here is for fantasy as world making. Now, it would be more than reasonable to consider this proposition by looking at it from a sociological slant by surveying the vast intricate and complex virtual worlds of fan communities organized around particular works of fantasy in literature, film, comic books, etc., and the networks of participants in cosplay and video games and the universes of ancillary text production in the myriad kinds of fan fiction and slash fiction. But my interest is in thinking of my chain of overlapping co-constitutive objects, which are fantasy, black fantasy, queer fantasy, black queer fantasy. I want to think about these chiefly as philosophical enterprises. In this, I depend upon a definition of philosophy that I like, that of novelist Charles Johnson, whose novels Faith in the Good Thing and Ox Herding Tale are at least in part essays of black philosophical fiction, black fiction that concerns itself with what Johnson identifies as the central questions of philosophical traditions. These questions are, what does freedom or happiness really mean? What does it look like to be free slash happy? How does one become free slash happy? For Johnson, philosophy is a guide to living. Likewise, I look to black fantasy as a guide of sorts, one best understood for me by recurrence to spatial metaphors. Black queer fantasy for me charts the road to and or sights in a habitable imaginary. I hate the world as it is, and I'm always looking and wishing for other worlds to go to. You might wonder if I'm advocating for what I'm going to call fantasy acts instead of what we tend to think of as action. Not at all. Fantasy acts do not require secession from other kinds of acts. Though it is worth pausing to consider about the to consider the differences between the results of fantasy acts and the results of other kinds of action. If an action does not result 
with sufficient proximity to count as an effect following a cause in one, someone injuring or killing someone else or depriving them of liberty, or two, someone stealing from someone else resources for living or prospering, or three, rescuing someone or yourself from a particular instance of being killed or maimed or deprived of liberty or stolen from, then how do we measure the consequences of an action? How do we become assured of its existence as distinct from the existence of other mental constructs like fantasies? If a million march on Washington is the result or the activity measurable as distinct from fantasy once it becomes, as it must, a memory, write-ups in a dozen newspapers, plans for later meetings and dreams of coalition, digital photographs on so many smartphone hard drives. You might also wonder if this elaborate attempt to take fantasy seriously as an intellectual and political tool is like clinging to, clinging to a plank of driftwood in the middle of a storm at sea, desperate. Yes, it is desperate. But desperation is not disqualifying. It's the other name of necessity. And the alias of invention, or perhaps invention's twin, with necessity and desperation co-parenting, is radical imagination. The ultimate project of keeping it unreal, which must reach beyond the book's end, for its achievement can't be encompassed in this book or any single book alone, is to cite whether and how Black fantasy can begin to undertake a description of ludicrous, unreal things, like Black happiness, how Black fantasy might retwist the twisted significations of Blackness such that Black and happy is at least not a clearly oxymoronic conjunction. Thank you. Thank you. And it's exciting to see people already responding so beautifully in the comments about how inspiring it is to think about Black happiness and joy. So um, I have a handful of questions for the panel, uh, but I'm not ultimately uh, hitched to any of these things. So I'm happy for the conversation to move in any direction. And I wanna start with something really broad. Um, I think one of the one of the most immediate features to me about keeping on keeping it, uh, it unreal is that it is a surprising text. Uh, every time I've taught it, every time I've reread it in the last year, I'm continually surprised by the moves and the turns of thought and argumentation. And I think everybody in this room, we've all studied some of the most ideological, conservative, and painful parts of um, the use of comics as a medium. And we've also studied some of its most imaginative and surprising parts. And I wanted to throw to, to the panelists, like what were elements of the argument that surprised you the most or that forced you to rethink things that you had, had held on to uh, in your own thought and writing? I mean, I have to say that one of the things that struck me um, was the extent to which our our social realities are consensual. And I think that the idea of consent maps nicely, Derek, onto your, your uh, political use of fantasy, right? I mean, because in this country, what we have now is half the country consents, for example, that queer people should be full citizens like everyone else and black people and women should all have the same rights as everyone else. But the other half of the country does not consent to this, right? And that it's the lack of consent that begins to structure how we must imagine our way out of, um, you know, it structures our, fantas our, our, our fantasies, you know, our fantasies of justice and of abundance and of more um, simply because we cannot come to a sort of lasting consensus about who we are, right? And so that was the, you know, your, your, your argument, this is not directly in the book, but this is where your book led me to think more critically about um, notions of consent and, and, and the role that fiction has in sort of authoring um, new ways of being, you know, together and being with. So I'll say, I mean, one thing that I continue to be interested in is what happens when you place Black people at the center of any kind of philosophical conceptual framework. And here um, it's Black people, but also like not Black queer subjects, but not exclusively so, um, to think about how that then reorients what we understand about um, 
genre and medium. And I found, you know, your intro is just so just breathtakingly beautiful. And I, you know, one of my favorite moves is how you sort of, you recast, you know, our sort of canonical superhero narratives or not all superhero narratives, but you know, some that we cast as superheroes like Harry Potter and things. And this other kind of version that has a sort of cultural specificity. And I was um, struck with like how we, how how do we deal with this question of um, fantasy in relationship to the radical or not? Like I was really struck um, by what you said, Ramsey, like, in the tra- like about this in terms of thinking about the black radical imagination. And and one of the things I was sort of wondering about is like, does fantasy always have to be radical to do something wholly otherwise, right? Like, can we imagine something like, does it have to be radical politics? Can it be actually something wholly otherwise, even if it is not something that you understand as radical? Like, what does what is it that we're trying to get with this idea of the radical and sometimes the pleasure of fantasy is not something that's regressive or conventional or sort of inhabiting sort of spaces where that are not necessarily made for one, but just something other that maybe the, like this idea of the radical political can't capture. And I do think that your book gets at this, like there is, there's some kind of affective space in the fantastic and a black fantastic that's trying to inhabit something wholly other that is not constrained by the ideological configurations or binaries around progressive or not. Yeah, yeah. that actually, Rebecca is, I'm sorry, Mark. Uh, no, no, please, Derek. Um, so uh, that actually was such an important part of the book for me was to think about fantasy as not having to be vouchsafed by its connection to some sort of, you know, utopian imagination. As much as I love that about fantasy, and that is one of the, the the key ways in which it can act in the world. But I was interested in that kind of engagement you have uh, with say uh, a superhero comic that you know is by no means radical in its conception or depiction or really pretty much anything that's happening in it, um, but a way that you can be engaged with it that is, as you say, has a kind of effective space that does something. Um, and it does something that I think we can grant or we can recognize having political valence of some kind. Uh, and it does something in terms of a transformation, just even in the moment, quite ephemeral though it may be, of yourself through imagination, uh, which then also has some, uh, can have some, again, ephemeral, perhaps not very traceable effects uh, in the way that you live or how you think about things and what you do or on what kinds of things, as Jonathan was saying, you consent to uh, or don't consent to. Michael, um, I interrupted you. So no, no, this is your this is your your show. Um, but I I I, I just would um, want to build on the two previous statements. I mean, one I would do want to sort of stick to the or, or think about the radical possibilities of fantasy. I think it is necessary. I think left wing comics, as they are, are entirely too dour and kind of explicitly educational in their purposes and resist the temptation to fantasize about what possible futures might be. And and in this left wing comics really do kind of, and in this I'm thinking socialist, communist, anarchist comics do really adhere to sort of Marx's prohibition against what he describes as writing recipes for the cook shops of the future. Um, but in reading your book, that's exactly what I would like to find. I, I would love to see people openly fantasizing about um, what the kind of luxury, fully luxury automated communism might in fact look like. At the same time, I, I take Rebecca's point very seriously about what possibilities are opened by putting black subjects at the center of any critical analysis. And I think that that, that transforms our understanding in, in deeply meaningful ways that your book is hugely suggestive of. And to just leap from what is present in the book to off the page, I think of, especially the passage you just read uh, from uh, Derek about the, the, the possibility and necessity and impossibility of black happiness. And to think about, you know, what, what has happened recently in Oakland, where the first sort of Karen attack or what we knew of it as, as a barbecue Becky of a white woman who called the cops on a bunch of African-American men and women trying to have a barbecue at Lake Merritt, which not only created a kind of online sensation, but has since then moved on to what we now know of as a kind of East Bay institution of the Black Joy Parade. 
in which black folks show up without any kind of larger political project, but to simply express pleasure and joy in public. And there's really not much of a way in which such an event could be seen as anything other than radical, as inherently political in these kinds of ways. I think it, it need not be contained by a political expression, but it yet is at the same time a kind of utopian fantasy of what if black bodies could occupy space in public in freedom. And in that I see expressions both in the comics that you write about and in the world around us, the ways in which we, we think of histor history as necessity and the need then to build a space or a realm of freedom within that realm of necessity. And in that, I think your book uh, really offers us a way of uh, exhorting all of us to uh, to fantasize, to indulge that not just desire, but indeed radical political necessity. You know, I I, I want to actually draw some of those threads together because part of what I love about this book is that I actually think that you reinvent the meaning of radicalism and you separate it from the question of a specific politics, left, right, progressive, etc. And radicalism becomes the practice of invention. Like to be radical is to break with what is happening. So you say, you know, on 24, but the fundamental tool of fantasy is thought, a different thought, perhaps thought freed from what it has been constrained to know as real, may, uh, may find some leverage for conducting the magic trick for a different set of results if it is accompanied by the transformative powers of repetition. In fantasy, we may detect reality's future shapes as well as its present habitability. And then you have this line that I, my students were just so taken with the other day. In this sense, then, fantasy is real and exists in the same manner as consciousness and love are and do. Indeed, both consciousness and love might easily be said to made up, as it were, a fantasy. And I think part of what I love about you, the way you always think, as a, I, I think of you as a Black existentialist in some ways, is that you're saying at some level, separate from any ideological matrix, like the literal brain matters capacity to invent, to to rat to like recombine all of these things that are that have already exist in the world into new formations creates the possibility for some kind of resistance that we do not know in advance what it will turn out. Like one version of it might be that left communism and one version might be something else. And I think that you commit yourself to that kind of uh, uncertainty, to the idea that what is really radical is not always knowing in advance what the fantasy will bring, even if you have motives behind it. And I find that to be an amazing rejoinder to, uh, to con certain contemporary social justice oriented politics that want a more progressive, more open-ended, more anti-racist world, but are also obsessed with knowing in advance what anti-racism looks like or what anti-sexism looks like. And is like very keen on telling everybody what the rules are, right? And my thing is like, but part of radical fantasizing is about the breaking of the rules and the invention of new ones. Uh, and that's something that I always find really exciting. I mean, what Rebecca was referring to, of course, in the book is how you have this set of lists of stories from fantasies that are inventions. And then you're like, but also religion is an invention. And also the state is an invention. And they're just different kinds of invention. Um, and what, what if we just decided that we would take charge and invent something else? And I find that so compelling. So I want to push back just a little yeah. Um, just to say, and this reminds me, like, you know, Ramsey has this really beautiful, beautiful moment in The New Mutants where he talks about this moment, the, this, you know, famous moment in, um, in Fantastic Four where they sort of lead T'Challa to this new future. And it's, it's a really beautiful utopian reading, but I, I resist it in all kinds of conceptual ways, despite, you know, because I, I do think one of the things I guess I, I did take from this book, and I, I guess I want to just have a conversation about, is that the the shift, and um, Jonathan and I were having an exchange briefly and thinking about how this book was in conversation with Michael Gillespie's film Blackness. There is this tendency, like you know, understandably, because it is a lot of what Black art does, and art that is not Black, but is referring to Black people, which is also an interesting question, so to think about this, but... Um, where it must be seen in relationship to the radical. It must be seen in relation to the revolutionary. It must be seen in relationship to a, a kind of politics that can bring us somewhere else. And that, you know, what, and so I'm always interested in what is foreclosed 
sometimes by that reading in terms of what kinds of affective spaces people inhabit. So in terms of the passage you read, what if the move towards this new real, like this is the real, is about an articulation of a quotidian that to call radical capitulates to the idea that the kinds of spaces people effectively conceptually inhabit has to be so excessively other than it's radical political imagination. You know what I'm saying? Like I, I just, and I, you know, I was thinking about, I don't know if you've seen the, the Netflix film, See You Yesterday. Um, so it was this black time travel film with this young black girl that came out a few years ago. And I remember talking about with Kenitra Jello, who has really thoughtful things to say about the idea of black horror and black fantasy and a number of other people who, who felt like it was, what was interesting about it is it's, you get the sort of, initially you think it's this conventional, like black girl, black girl genius gets her time travel story like Back to the Future. And then they have all these references, like Michael J. Fox is the teacher at the beginning and she's reading Kindred and all these things. But the nature of the real, of, of the, the nature of Black um, death to Black teenage boys and all these things, there's a disruption to the possibility of the generic pleasures of the film. So it forecloses, the, the way in which it's working with the real forecloses pleasure, I think, in certain ways that we expect it. So I guess I just, I'm always interested in what happens when we're trying to have a, a vocabulary that doesn't always go towards this idea of radical politics. And, and I feel like this book helps me think about that. Well, this actually speaks to the question I wanted to ask next. Um, um, so the question I had written down is, um, what do you make of the ways in which Derek sidesteps or pushes back just in the way that Rebecca, that you're pushing back against the tendency to always have to read the positive good of fantasy as its radicalism, as opposed to any number of other effects that it can have. I think that Derek also pushes back against the tendency to, to see fantasy as a site of identification. That the reason we love fantasy is because I get to see myself as Black Panther. I get to see myself as Storm. And Derek kind of says like, actually, the power of these fantasies is their disruption often of identification, kind of the shattering outward of all these possibilities. And I think it speaks to what you were saying, Rebecca, that in some ways doing something other than identification also opens up all these other pleasures that are quotidian for different viewers that may have nothing to do with seeing themselves in these texts. And so I would be interested to hear people um, kind of think through a little bit what what you thought of Derek's kind of approach to identification or what you think of in terms of just fantasy broadly and that concept. I mean, I guess I have a I have a similar moment to Derek's moment where like my deep and abiding affection for the X-Men is precisely because of the presence, the sustained presence, importantly, of Storm. Right, and it's just like, so here is this black person, black woman that I don't necessarily identify with, but her presence suggests that I am safe or welcome in this space, right? Um, and actually you, um, that's one of the places that identification is tricky because, um, and you, 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 you make a note of it, Derek, and you move on rather quickly from the idea that, um, Marvel and DC, these superhero publishers, were trying to bring in this new black middle class and trying to attract this broader audience, right? And so including Nubia, including Storm, including the Falcon, et cetera, et cetera, is a way to signal to a certain audience, and I am one of them and so are you, that you have a place in this narrative, right? Um, but Ramsey, to your point, um, I'm always struck by um, <laughs> by uh, Nicholas Coppola and, you know, and the choice he makes when he wants to take on a stage name so that, you know, nepotism is not quite so obvious. Um, he identifies very strongly with, with Luke Cage, right? And here's this, you know, wealthy child of a dynastic family who is identifying with Luke Cage, the ex-con, and so he becomes Nick Cage, Right, and so there, there are all, there are always these sorts of moments where that kind of identification is surprising or or you know sort of contrapuntal. I think just some respond to a few things that we've been talking about just now. Um, I think I you know I wanted in this book to 
try to give an account of forms of response and engagement with reality that actually are quotidian, but that we put under the label of fantasy. Now there's a way where, of course, especially when we talk about fantasy in a academic context, um, we, we can often shade over into talking about the radical aspects of it or reading it radically. But like when I was trying to think about even how I engage with the character Nubia, especially engage with the character Nubia from the first time that I saw her with the, she's there, oh, actually maybe Mark, if you could throw, show that picture of the, of Wonder Woman, uh, and yes, exactly that one, where she's wearing the leopard skin uh, outfit that she never wears anyplace else because luckily, because it's so ridiculously offensive and yet also fabulous in its own weird way. Um, the response that I had to that was one, not really identification, although partly some kind of identification, some sort of sense of aspiration of being like her, uh, but more probably thinking about her as being some protector of, of mine when I was you know, seven or eight years old and I saw that. Um, but also that it's, uh, you know, it's not, it's not a, there's nothing particularly radical about the figure. Uh, even placing a black woman in the center of the frame as Wonder Woman's black twin sister who has all the powers of Wonder Woman who essentially is the black Wonder Woman. Um, you know, it's not especially, it, 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 I don't really even know what kind of radical politics you really get out of that. Um, but I, what I wanted to get to was it, it sparks something in my imagination which makes me attentive to something that isn't really present in the world as it is and makes me do something within myself uh, that is that I wanted to give an account of that you know that that probably has very quotidian effects that is its effects insofar as they have there are effects that are in the world or something that would just be happening that nobody would be able to know that that's that somehow results from my absolute undying and continual love of Nubia uh, but you know it's it, it, it's I, I was really interested in trying to to look at that and for me one of the the best lines is not my line uh, but a line from the Wiz where Eveline says, don't nobody bring me no bad news. And I like that because it's just about like, that's about, you know, we have our horribly anti-Black world. We have all the things happening that we have happening and they demand our attention. But if I'm inhabiting Eveline there, what I'm thinking is, but I'm gonna pay attention to something else that I'm choosing here. And that is quotidian, but I think extremely important to claim that attention to something quite inventive, perhaps, uh, or something real, whatever it is, uh, that is not necessarily fully engulfed by the, you know, the 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 narratives of and the the continual wily reinventions of anti-blackness. So actually, you know, with that in mind, I'm happy to talk more about identification if people wanted to say say something, but. Maybe we can roll it into, you know, the other question I wanted to ask, I think it's usually, it's easy to start with comics with like, well, wh why comics? But I want to kind of flip it and say, you know, what does this book do for Black studies? I, I think that this book has a really, really interesting relationship that is oblique to Black studies that is both deeply within that tradition and also kind of lovingly moving to the side of some of its uh, most powerful contemporary currents. And I've often said to you in conversation, like your work reminds me so much of the work of Stephen Best, your own colleague, you know, and of Jennifer Nash, people who are both working within and kind of against certain movements within the field. And I'd really be interested because almost everybody in this room, right, I'm kind of the exception actually, works either in black studies or very much related to the history of race and racialization. I'd be interested to see how people thought of this book's place in that tradition and its engagement with that thought, which is so prominent and important right now uh, in our conversations. Uh, just to, I think Rebecca is sort of named it to begin with. I mean, this question of it, it, it deploys a kind of the a black studies methodology or black study methodology of simply putting black subjects, black readers, black identifications at the center of the narrative. Uh, and particularly in a comic, a, a, a genre, uh, an industry that has, as Derek also chronicles throughout the book, that has historically marginalized both black characters and black creators. And so it, it sent, re-centers them in a necessary way. And I think that's a fundamental uh, 
element of any kind of black studies methodology. Um, at the same time, like, you know, reasserting the role of fantasy in that regard, I think is, you know, a, a, I prefer to see it as a necessary dramatic um, innovation that is being presented to us rather than something that is oblique or marginal within black studies. I think it is drawing something, you know, taking upon itself to, to innovate uh, in a way that I think Derek is uniquely uh, capable of doing, of both drawing this, this, this you know, the, the queer black um, uh, comic book depictions and representations to the center of the story, um, but also to write, uh, to build off of this larger uh, question of fantasy. I mean, I think that I, I take, you know, the the phrase, this, the passage that really moved me about how where Derek writes about in finding ways to use fantasy, we also take notice of how fantasies use us to build the prisons of our reality and to build off of, you know, I think in another really moving paragraph for me from the very beginning, he writes, what if uh, there were no racism or anti-blackness or sexism or misogyny or homophobia or classism or ableism or transphobia or any of the horribly effective ways the modern world is found to create disposable people. And I think that that phrase, incredibly moving as it is, is the power of what black study is capable of doing and saying that we can take this previously marginalized understanding, move it into the center of our consciousness, our awareness, our politics, our scholarship, and allow black study to actually do what it is meant to do, which is to figure out how to free everyone, to think about what freedom looks like for all of us. Yeah, and I'll... Um in some ways it goes back to the identification question, I think at the heart of it. And I was thinking of this in terms of comics that one thing I think with McLeod is, you know, as much as I admire understanding comics, his idea of like what prompts identification is this sort of neutral figure is just not right. <laughs> so it doesn't, it doesn't help us think about how a whole bunch of other of rest of us engage with comics. But um, I think that, you know, foundational to black studies is, is often the question of, you know, what happens when, um, we see ourselves, which is, you know, and, and all the ways in which we sort of have to think about that question, we can go back from early African-American photography to data portraits to Du Bois and all these other contexts, and that there are a whole bunch of scripts about what seeing ourselves mean, both in academic discourse and now popular discourse about like people saying, I feel seen, right? And then I think that there's a pressing urgency in both, you know, recognizing the very genealogies of that in ways that sometimes are just not historicized the way that they could, but also the simplified versions of what it means to, for black people to be present, right? And to, and that, um, that it doesn't, our bodies present don't always mean what people think it means, <laughs> that it can mean a whole bunch of different things. And there's actually, um, more possibility than what sometimes feels like an, a, a, an increasingly essentialist framing about black aesthetic possibility in the present, um, even with all this, you know, really sort of extraordinary sort of creative production and, and, and as well as sort of people imagining various kinds of political possibilities or, ra or ways of being and, and relating to each other in the world. So I think that the book helps us um, again, push and, and as a mode of philosophy and ontology about thinking about fantasy as helping us understand the question of Black ontology and what it means to be and be present, both in representation in the world and sort of habitus is, is essential. Yeah, and if I can, just, just to come back to something I that maybe I wasn't as clear on as, as I'll try to be now, um, your, your evocation of Fanon is what led me to then think about Moten. And so when I was referencing before consent, I was thinking especially about, you know, the, 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 the trilogy consent not to be a single being. And, you know, because you, you do such a good job of talking about the ways that Blackness is pushed to the margin, but Moten does such a good job of demonstrating, you know, how Black people are always flipping that script and are always, always wind up you know, repositioned at the center by the very act of trying to move us to the margins, right? And so I thought that you gave a different, um, a different point of view, a different valence on that through your through your presentation. You know, sort of sort of throughout a fantasy as this kind of mode of resistant resistance, but this quotidian mode of resistance. Um, and so yeah, and so and so this this sort of 
you know, this willingness to consent to be many things at the same time, right? To be black and queer and a geek and a nerd and radical and all of these things and how your apprehension, you, you Derek, your apprehension of Nubia shifts and shifts and shifts and shifts as you access all of the use that you are, right? And so I think that, you know, so, so there is an interesting, um, this sort of an interesting thing that you open up through your approach. Thank you. I mean, I think that that describes really nicely exactly what my sort of attachment to Nubia has been, that kind of morphing thing as I look at it differently as I move through my life, you know, it just is a different, a different way that it lands or becomes um, or facilitates something, some sort of transformation for me. Um, I kind of want to go back to what Rebecca was saying about the, the the desire to or the push for um, representation that allows you to say I feel seen, um, which I both applaud and and on the other hand I also recognize that, that isn't necessarily the way that I approach art um, and maybe I don't approach art of any kind that I mean that is to say comic books to literature to film all, all these things I maybe I don't approach with the desire to be seen because I wasn't, uh, because I had, I became inculcated in a way of, you know, of, of reading and of approaching where I wasn't seen. So Nubia wasn't seeing me. Uh, Luke Cage wasn't seeing me. Uh, Storm wasn't seeing me. I loved them, but they weren't seeing me. That wasn't me being represented in those unreal worlds of, of comic books. Um, but they were, I always think of it for me as like springboards. They were, they were, um, they were some kind of presence, um, and in a particular and interesting way um, that, because it was comic books and it was unreal, allowed me to think about all kinds of ways of, of the world being different, of the world not being what the real world is, but also of myself being different. Um, so that it really isn't. It, that's why, I mean, I think I spent a lot of time in, in the book kind of talking about how we, there's been a long discourse about the way that comics are about identification, that I'm looking at it to, like, if I'm going to, you know, I want to see a, a Black Spider-Man uh, because it's going to make me feel as a Black child that I'm going to, you know, I'll have the, the powers of Spider-Man and I'll be able to have a power fantasy the same way as a white boy could because he sees Peter Parker. Um, and that's all fine. It's just not necessarily... The, it's not what my experience was, and it's also not necessarily for me what is most uh, interesting about what superhero comics, for example, can do. Um, and I think there's something about it that there's a little bit of the, there's a strain of the, the response from outside of comics to comics that always is about identification. So that, you know, when Frederick Wortham is saying, these things are dangerous. These kids are looking at these things and, 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 and they're, 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 they're modeling delinquency and then they're modeling homosexuality and they're, they're identifying with these characters. I think all of that is a, it's, it's a strange way of actually thinking about how comics are really operating for people. Like, whether, are you really identifying with the characters? They're so unreal. Um, is, that really, is, that, is it really the process of identification or is there something more nuanced than identification itself going on. And I was trying to track that more nuanced um, process whereby the character and whatever they're doing in the story becomes a springboard to imagination rather than a point of fixation uh, as to of, of possibilities. I mean, maybe one way of thinking about it, I was thinking as you're talking is to try to rework a kind of black common sense of reception or, or consumption, right? Like that there's a, there's a kind of black common sense that goes on right now. I think about what representation means that I think we have to just continually um, push back against. I just want to, I want to co-sign that because I think Derek knows all too well. That's like basically all of my work has now been about like unraveling that idea that that's what we're really looking for uh, is identification. And I think, tell me Derek, if I'm off, but I actually think what your work does is it shifts us from the question of identification to the question of affective impact, right? Like you were talking about the aesthetic, like what does it mean to encounter a character, a work of art and to be moved deeply, 
right? To be actually like impacted by this thing, which is a very old question, right? In the history of literary and cultural analysis. Like this takes us back to the beginning, the origins and the roots of the question of like beauty and and, and aesthetic impact and, and feeling states. And I think part of what you're saying is that like, the way we feel, the way we are impacted is deeply, deeply shaped, of course, by racialization, by gender and sexuality, but not only, and not always, and maybe not even primarily, right? And there's a way in which sometimes, um, I love the way Jonathan was talking about your reading, you kind of do this kaleidoscopic, vertiginous thing where you'll take Nubia and you'll say, and then this image of this character kept impacting me in one way and then another and then another and then another and enfolding itself into my experience. And I do find, you know, to speak to Rebecca's point, when I teach students today and I, and I say like, well, what else is happening to you when you're looking at this thing? They actually feel quite freed when they don't have to just look for representations of themselves. They start like something opens out for them and they're like, oh, I'm a sensate body that is capable of feeling many things about the cultural objects I'm encountering. And so the reason I have this long comment is because I actually think that that is how your writing works. Like you write as a scholar and a cultural critic and your writing is sensuous and it invokes in the reader like the feeling of being moved. Like your, your, your sentences are very moving. So that's kind of another question I would ask is, like, what is the aesthetic experience for people of actually reading Derek's way of writing about fantasy, which I think is very distinct and unique? Yeah, I, I agree with that completely, Ramsey. I mean, it's, it's, it's extraordinarily well written. It's a beautiful book. The sentences have this kind of circular rhythm to them that, that always move forward while circling back and circling back. There's something really quite... Uh, distinctly beautiful uh, about it. I, I think like there's there's a tremendous amount of you know autobiography in all of this. I, I have to imagine that that many of us uh, who are here, or those of you who are out in Zoomland, are here watching this because you know Derek as a friend or as a uh, as a scholar. But also, but for those of you who don't, you know, in reading this book, you genuinely get to know this <laughs> this the author. I mean, he's uh, you know we we meet you know we get a his heroic origin story of the seven year old Derek. Uh, Scott on a, a U.S. Army base in Germany buying his first comic book. And we get these really quite intense stories about you engaging with your father, uh, about his fascination with comic books and the like. But I also think that we get in here um, what to, to my mind is just both very deeply personal, distinctly Derek, but also quite transformative methodology of writing uh, as an act of revenge. Um, I love the the methodology uh, presented in this book is an act of revenge against uh, Trump and his rising tide of fascist stupidity. And, uh, and I found that uh, to be both um, present in each and every sentence, but also, you know, transformatively illuminating. <laughs> yeah, I thought you would appreciate that, Michael. <laughs> yeah, that was, I loved it. <laughs> I mean, it's funny, there's, you know, a convention with comic studies writing that we all have to have like an apology, like about why we're writing something about comics, right? But, and so, um, and I, you know, and I think what's what's interesting here is that you, you're giving this long sort of origin story, which we almost all, like we sometimes were called to feel this. I had a version of it and I just took it out. It's like, I refuse, I refuse, you know, to, to do it. Um, but maybe maybe the rules should be now. It's like if you know if you can't write this as beautifully as Derek Scott, you just you, let's not let's let's skip <laughs> let's skip the origin story of comics and just get right right to it. <laughs> I actually wanted to ping back a little bit to when we were talking about um, identification. Also, I just wanted to say that my sort of approach to that question of identification and responses to art and like what you're asking Ramsey about, like I'm, am I looking at effective res uh, responses as opposed to identification? It really goes back to when I was a graduate student and reading uh, the work of Coben and Mercer and Isaac Julian. They wrote this long essay where they, one of the things that just stuck out for me, and this is probably, I don't know, 1990 or something like that, or 89 even, uh, where they said, you know, we're often looking at 
Black representation as though it was political representation, as though it's like you're electing a member to the, you, the, the House of Representatives or the member of parliament. That kind of representation isn't the representation that art can do or even should do. Um, and that's the way I've always kind of looked at it. And that, I mean, that kind of named what I was already doing in some ways as a responder uh, to uh, art that involves black people or that is black art. Um, and uh, it certainly guided me in terms of my own critical methodology going forward. Yeah, I just briefly, I think we, we do see in this this work an example, I think it's been come up in, in a few comments already, of, of a kind of writing about the engagement uh, with art that has to go on without guarantees, as Stuart Hall and Paul Gilroy would say, that just because you are this kind of body, seeing the similar kind of body on a comic book page, that that should structure or guarantee the ways in which you uh, engage that or receive that, and that this what Derek offers us is a kind of writing that it goes on without guarantees, right? And one that is, in this case, explicitly queer, that we can queer our readings because that is a way of both escaping a certain predetermined set of guarantees that structure, but in particular, the marketplace of serialized literature. Right, that we, we often think about these kind of identities are presented in a top town way saying, well, how many comic books can we sell to black people? How many comic books can we sell to this audience or that audience? And I think that in evading all of that, you give us an example of what it is to write, to think, to feel without guarantees. That's so beautifully said. That feels very true to me. Um... I'm going to ask, we still have a little bit more time for us to talk, but I actually re really want to take the questions of the audience. So I'm going to ask the one question I'm supposed to ask, why comics, right? Like why, we, that's the other thing we always have to do is like, why are comics such a privileged site for doing this kind of work? Why do any of us in this room or in this, in this chat, right? Why do we care about comics? A question far too vast to answer fully in this kind of forum. But I think for our audience members who may not be, comics uh, people, I, I always think it's kind of good to rehash that set of questions. Can I just say why not and move on? <laughs> because we love them. Wait, I guess the way I want to ask this is not, I'm not asking it in the sense of like, why the value of comics, right? Which I take as a given, but what it is that you find so incredibly compelling about the medium uh, as a place for doing the kind of work that you do. Well, my answer to that is, you know, I think what I probably try to spend the entire book doing, which is to, or tracing, which is that um, it's compelling for me because it requires me just to read the comic, requires me to engage in an active process of imagination, which is then not only useful for me in the real world, uh, but also um, pleasurable and uh, important and vital for me as part of my own inner life is to have that kind of imagination. Um, and, you know, for those who are not in the comics studies world, it's like a, you know, just a kind of fundamental thing. You're looking at a page, uh, whether, you know, it's on the digital or, or, or paper, uh, and there are panels and there are static drawings, and then you've got to go to the next panel. So you've got to imagine movement between them. You've got to imagine connection between them. It's just a, it's just a very basic aspect of, of comics, uh, whether they're superhero or anything else. Um, and that that active imagination that's partly textual, partly visual, partly all these other things that it's sort of bringing together that, you know, that's what's compelling about it's it's a, it's the form and the content somehow that that both seem to latch into my um, imagination and, and brought about my writing of this book. I'm going to I'm going to borrow from from Derek and say, um, as an act of revenge. Right. You know, the um, you know, the, the things that I did growing up, um, play basketball, read comic books, listen to hip hop music. And, um, you know, my aching knees mean that I can't play basketball anymore, but I still am able to find profound amounts of meaning, political meaning, but also to find profound amounts of joy in, you know, listening to music and reading comics. Right. And so. Um, you know, this, this, 
this transcendence that people would want to associate with like opera and all other things. I mean, I never experienced that, but I did experience that listening to Illmatic. You know, I did experience that, you know, reading Chris Claremont's X-Men or some version of that. And so I never really understood or, you know, Derek, to go back to graduate school, I was always translating experiences or mediating them through hip hop and through comics as a way to make sense of what, of the kind of artistic claims or, or, or um, epistemological claims that people were making. And so it's like, well, wait a minute, then why am I writing about, you know, Ralph Ellison? Why not just write about, you know, uh, Kyle Baker? Right. If if I'm if I'm making those sort of conceptual moves in my head anyway, then let's just spend the time doing that. I'll say, I mean, I'm probably a little more um, promiscuous with the number of genres can give me pleasure in all kinds of ways. But what I would say is that um, uh, to all of these points, the form and content issue, I think, is really important. And I, I think I'll just also double down on a, in a disciplinary way about how the lack of attentiveness to comics means there are a whole bunch of things that we're conceptually and you're we're not understanding right so right now i'm working on something where i'm thinking about um african-american artists who whose early work was as cartoonists and the ways in which the connection between the art world and um and comics and cartoon art is just you know we're losing history in terms of what's not archived but also just really understanding these links i um i think obviously in terms of literary studies to conceptually understand what it means to position um african-american comics and cartoon art in relationship to african-american literature but also in relationship to broader histories of black visual culture is really important um there are various contexts obviously in history where how important um comics and cartoon art, you know, specifically, and editorial cartoons and various things are often just used as illustrations in ways that don't take um, editorial cartoonists seriously as thinkers and theorizers of the state, right? And how important that has been historically, and particularly the number of Black cartoonists for whom that has been true, from comic strip creators to editorial cartoonists is really important. So there are a variety of different disciplines that I think really need to engage with the form. I mean, I think there's an interesting slippage in your book between like, um, saying all of comics when you're very much talking about superhero comics and cartoon art. So there's a, there's an, um, it is interesting about the difference genre makes, which I do think there's a, a deep difference in terms of what the, the generic forms do. Um, but that's my reason. I think that, you know, we're just, there are things we don't know and understand unless we really take the medium seriously. Yeah, I agree with that entirely. I think, the, and then and Rebecca's research in the field of, you know, uh, early 20th century black cartoonists is really hugely important. Um, I, I would also just add, I think it, it's probably obvious, but it's worth stating is that superheroes are ubiquitous now. Our mass culture is just completely saturated with them. I mean, there's far more comic book movies out there than I have the time to watch in TV series. And I mean, they just have completely taken over our popular culture. And there's this very lengthy genealogy of these characters that needs to be excavated, that needs to be dug up and worked through quite critically. I mean, I think Derek points the way in his writing about Luke Cage and Blade and um, and Black Panther in general. And I, and, you know, it, it's, it's one of those realities that, you know, the, the ubiquity of, of, you know, superhero movies uh, belies their kinds of origins. I mean, I, I to me, I, I think it's always worth remembering the ways in which Superman and Green Lantern and others in their origins, the Golden Age era, were the products of working class writers for working class audiences in the midst of the Great Depression. And Superman began his career fighting weapons manufacturers and unscrupulous advertisers. And the Green Lantern actually intervenes in a taxi cab strike in the late 1930s. And today, like the Cold War deformed all of that and neoliberalism continues to twist it even more so that the, our, our preferred superheroes now are not the kind of altruistic um, uh, visionaries, but the, you know, neoliberal douchebags like Tony Stark and Bruce Wayne. Um, there, there is this kind of, this, this, there has to be a pushback or at least a critical examination of that, which has gone from admittedly a kind of marginal cultural expression to completely dominating the arch capitalist center of our society, of our, our popular culture. I want to actually respond to that and both agree and disagree because I think that is right up to a point. But 
I mean, Derek and I talk about this all the time, um, what I'm about to say. What I think is interesting is that like the resurgence of the superhero as a fetish of American popular culture initially was very much a reaction to 9-11 and to the rise of the security state and the desire to circulate these images of national protectors, which is why all of the the first movies are really like Captain America, Iron Man, et cetera. Now, I think what happened by sheer historical accident is that as these mass social movements around racial social justice, gender social justice resurged in the US, people began to remember that the superhero is fundamentally about distinction. Like superheroes are all different from one another. They're this like endless proliferation of different kinds of bodies with different powers. So now what's happened is a shift where the neoliberal, as you were putting it, douchebag model is being replaced by the multiverse model, which is all about the endless proliferation of differentiation. That's also still wrapped up deeply in capitalism, right? Because it's about producing as much TV sh content and movie content as you can to sell. But one of its great virtues is that it is addressing the problem of human plurality that people are fundamentally different from one another. So Derek and I had been talking the other night, like I'm obsessed with Spider-Man into the Spider-Verse and I'm writing about it now. And when I teach that to my students, they're like, this is the most amazing commentary on the problem of diversity because it's not about representational diversity. It's about plurality, right? Like it is about the fundamental fact that human beings are already diverse. You don't need to simply insert marginal identities, if you look at the fact that human beings are incredibly complex and heterogeneous, what if you started there? And so I do think there is the twit, like the, the, um, the best parts of the superhero are also being uh, brought into this new wave. And I say all of this to just say, for me, the reason I love comics is because they're so multiplicious. Like most mediums, novels, you know, movies can do some of what Comics do, of course, like mediums borrow from each other, but comics kind of concatenate so many different elements. They heighten the idea that media media are about multiplying kind of um, different variables. And I find that really, really compelling. So I feel more sympathetic to the contemporary shift in superhero storytelling than the earlier part. Ramsey, what's, what's interesting about that too is that I guess evidence for your claim is all the online complaining about the diversity slash plurality, right? Which is like, oh my God, where they're 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 they've they've gone too far, you know? And so I so yes, I think that 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 speaks precisely to the kind of um, uh, plurality that 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 you're celebrating. And actually, it's interesting. Somebody in the uh, chat said, you know, but one of the taglines of Spider Man into the Spider Verse is "You're like me." Um, uh, to bring us back to how identification does and doesn't work. And one thing I would say is I think actually part of the genius of the movie is it's always about you're like me, but not exactly me. It's all about like anyone could inhabit the figure of Spider-Man and every person would do it in a distinct way that is never fully commensurate with anybody else. There's a mutual recognition moment and whenever the spider people meet each other in the, the movie, there's like a brief moment of coming together, like we're the same. And then there's like splitting again. And I love that. Like that to me is what, what like, what politics is about, right? It's about the coming to together and the splitting apart. And I, that's kind of my, what is compelling to me about that movie among many other things. Um, so I think this is a great time to shift to questions from the audience that I already have a list of them. And I can keep, um, Jonathan was reminding us that another tagline is anyone can wear the mask, which is, is so beautiful. Um, so I'm just gonna go through some of the ones that we have listed already. And I love, I love Juana Maria Rodriguez, sending my heart to you. And she asked at the beginning, um, she said, I love the turn to fantasy. And I hope we might say more about the connection to sexual fantasy and the exploration of other modes of erotic and social relations. And of course, the last chapter of the of Derek's book is very much about this. So I would throw this out to everyone, but I'd love to hear Derek start on that question. Well, I'm, I'm, I'm wondering what Juana is, is asking about it specifically in terms of whether 
comics um, provide a kind of, um, again, springboards for imaginations of different forms of sexual practice or being or not, or whether, I'm not sure exactly what she's thinking about in, in that question. Um, I guess w when I was thinking about the um, significance of sexual fantasy in superhero comics, which is a genre of comics that of course is not really about sex um, in a explicit way, but always has a kind of implicit uh, sexualization of the body in the way that the things are de depicted, all kinds of elements to it, which can which lend themselves uh, to some sort of sexualization. I was really interested in, in kind of taking that, um, that element which remains actively suppressed, right? So that it's not, it's not even just that, oh, this, the comic is for kids and we're not gonna talk about sex. It's that, like, as I mentioned before, Frederick Wortham and the, the advent of the Comics Code Authority the, with, the, with the, the comics that were, being, which were not marginal at all, at all, actually, which were being read by everybody, uh, which were being, uh, which had cells of millions upon millions per month uh, during World War II and immediately after. Um, that those comics were, um, according to Wortham and those who went along with them, were some sort of you know, covert um, uh, initiation of readers into BDSM practices and to being gay and everything else. Um, and I was interested in, in, in that because I think there is something about um, even these comics that really aren't particularly depicting these things in any explicit way um, that can allow for a springboard of imagination of sexual difference uh, and uh, that people read them that way. Uh, that I mean, that's queer readers have been doing that before. So there was a way where Wortham was right uh, about some aspect of it and you know wrong in, in other ways, wrong in terms of the homophobia, right perhaps in actually identifying that there is a, a sort of queer reading you are allowed or facilitated to have of superhero comics. Um, and then I, you know, in, in the book, I talk about erotic cartoonists who actually just take that up and take it to its, you know, its, its logical conclusion where it's, it's just all about the sex actually. But um, so that, that's my response. I mean, with Wortham, I mean, it's, I mean, Wonder Woman, I mean, it's just straight up, you, 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 it's hard to go through an issue where she's not tied up or someone else having the early wonder, it's like, it's, it's bondage, bondage everywhere. Um, and what you showed my students, like they can't unsee it really. Mm -hmm. um, but so not wrong about poly, um, polyamory and bondage and that and Wonder Woman. Mm -hmm. But I mean, I do think uh, there is something interesting because again, I was thinking about the genre difference and I, I just happened to be teaching, my favorite thing is Monsters this week. And I also mm -hmm. brought in a whole bunch of, um, women's comics um, from the 1970s and early 80s and other early comics like Tits and Clits and how, um, and you know, and how my students read them because they just really, and, and also like some French comics like Ah Nana, like, you know, who only had, they had only nine issues before. I think it was the incest issue that did it in and they forbid it, but um, that, you know, that's much more radical, like this idea that, you know, that what we see in terms of, you know, representation inevitably becomes more radical or more explicit as time goes on. And they're looking at these comics and they're going, what? this was like, what year? What year was this? Like, and that there was, um, even as these are comics that are very concerned about Americana and every day. So they're both, com they're comics that are explicitly about um, being as part of the underground comics movement as being transgressive. But at the same time, they're very much concerned about like, the the Americana that is every day, right? So that these things are working together at the same time, right? Um, in the feminist and gay comics of the period. And I mean, I think it's interesting to go through, I mean, you go to like what Spike Troutman is doing or some other like erotic comics that you might see um, right now. Um, you know, I'm, I've been trying to sort of work through like, how do we understand this genealogy? Is there one? Is it do people see such connections or do we see also um, like my favorite thing is monsters to the identification point. The, the points of identification is everything from high art to the wolf man to horror films, right? Like, so it, it's a film that it's a book that um, it's a graphic novel that deeply complicates your common sense ideas of identification and sexual fantasy. Right. So there's just such a long genealogy of that in comics. That's I think plays out in such, you know, really intriguing ways. 
And I would just, you know, just quickly add, I think, um, to to draw Juana's question specifically to the chapter that you write a, that you write about, Derek, that you have this amazing moment where you just say, like, oh, the simple ability, uh, excuse me if I'm scandalizing anybody, of being able to draw internal ejaculation in gay male sex is this like incredibly fantastical moment, something that like cinematic apparatus cannot do. Like you can't have a camera small enough to like go in and show you that. And it wouldn't, it would, it wouldn't visually make sense. And I think there is a way in which because of that conceit, Derek and I always talk about that anything can be, that can be drawn can be believed in comics. There is a way in which comics like really lend themselves to the exploration of sexual fantasy because of the expansive possibilities of being able to draw out every different like imagined scenario um, that you that you can conceive of. So we have another question from earlier. John Martin uh, made a comment that I think is actually really interesting and unusual. said Victor Laval has suggested that horror for him, isn't just about defeating the monster, but about defeating real life, which is often worse than the monster. Is this also a form of joy? Which feels very much like what your what the whole book is about. I'm just yes, saying, yes, I would totally agree with that. Yeah, uh, I, I didn't know Victor Laval had said that, but that's uh, that that to me is. Uh, I mean, it, 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 it pertains to what's come up a couple of times. Revenge is also a form of joy in a certain way. So, uh, so yeah, I would think I agree with that. Yeah, I, I would I would just say that the um the ending of Get Out where you have the 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 police cruiser pull up with the with the lights on and that feeling in the pit of your stomach that oh my god he's gone through all of this and now this redneck cop is gonna and it it's his best friend like that's the moment that's like a profound moment of joy which is precisely like the, the monster's been defeated but you've also defeated this carceral reality because the person in the police cruiser is, is actually your ally so that that's another sort of clear example of that that you know that evocation of joy past defeating the monster Uh, yeah, I mean, quickly, it, it just makes me think of something like Lovecraft Country, too, where it's like there may be monsters in the woods, but there's no monster bigger than a southern sheriff. You know, I was actually going to say, I, I've taught Lovecraft Country a couple times now, and it's so mind boggling to my students. Um, and a, a, one thing I'm just amazed by is the revenge fantasy. It It has extraordinary images of black violence towards white bodies right it has a huge amount of violence towards black bodies as well because it's it's trying to like it, it's it's realism is to set you in in like the history of segregation but it's also like it is this amazing fantasy of black people like literally beating white people to death with bats in certain scenes right like it's really it's quite extraordinary and i think it's it gives you all different kinds of joy right like the joy of that revenge and then for me like the the most incredible one of the most incredible things i've ever seen on tv is the hippolyta episode episode seven in which there is the joy of this black woman being able to travel back and forth through every time period to become anything and everything right and i um yeah like i think I don't, i'm just pontificating I, that, that's I, I love the example of lovecraft country Mm -hmm. But I might turn it back to Victor yeah. and and Victor's. Um, I, you were teaching the show, I guess, not the novel, but um, Victor's fantastic take on Lovecraft, the Ballad of Black Tom, um, which, you know, has. I mean, the thing I was thinking of this. I'm saying this because between that and Destroyer, right, which is like take on Black Frankenstein or change, like, like he's he always sort of there's like he he can do the revenge fantasy, but then there's like this undercutting like you you were joyous about something that happens but then it's mournful it's so it's very complicated like this sort of um you know affective like I, I think he sort of redefines what joy looks like in the real honestly like it's like it's a kind of complicated black joy i would say at the end of his text um and bow to black tom i think is you know because there's this set of things and there was this good podcast with him and john jennings and kenitra um kenitra books um, talking about um, 
Lovecraft country and like attachments to Lovecraft and what it means for black people to sort of want to rework it. And I guess Spike Lee is still getting ready to do a Lovecraft film. Is that right? Um, I think he is. So um, that, that there's like, so even things that you're not supposed to be attached to, like people will take it and that they rework it. And there's still like, there's a pleasure attachment people have of a black reworking of these things that are, can be horrible racist imaginaries, you know? Uh, you know, and uh, just to quickly to respond to that, I mean, that's the thing I find fascinating about the TV show is that it is so deeply ambivalent and split. It's like in order to have a lot of the black fantasy that happens in that show, other things have to be shut out. Like the alliance between black women and white women, the like the lesbian alliance has to disappear. You know, the possibility that the queer men might be central to the story, like their entire history has to disappear. So the, I think that the show is actually quite ambivalent. It says like, to have one kind of black fantasy, other possible uh, connections have to be lost. And I think you're right. I mean, I think it's a very ambivalent. So. Ramsey, for some reason you're muted. It never fails. <laughs> um, right, so uh, one. Uh, let's take one last question and then maybe we could just do a quick wrap up if people have final comments on the panel. Um, earlier when we were talking about uh, when Rebecca was really pushing us to think about why it is that we always have to attach the label of radical um, to fantasy in order for it to be meaningful, um, Tiger Eyes said, what if the habitable imaginary is the more mundane one? Could this make other realities more possible through such fantasy? And I think that's kind of a broad question. I think we were already addressing it earlier, but maybe we could just comment one more time on the question of the mundane, the quotidian. I guess there, for me, there are a number of different inflections to answering that question. So one of them for me is that um, I was trying to, in the book, propose that the necessity of there being a line that one could draw between a fantasy and the appearance of what we call the real um, beyond one's own mind or beyond the collective minds of those who are fantasizing together about, say, a particular uh, comic book or a film or whatever, um, that I wasn't... Um, I wasn't, I was feeling like I didn't want to, to need to make sure that that's the kind of transformation I'm looking at in order to say that fantasy is important. Uh, that I was trying to think about some other kind of work that's being done that's it's harder to, to track, but I try to put it under that term of it's a transformation of being because I was using uh, Leo Bersani's way of thinking about uh, um, fantasy as being like memory in the brain and that the memory is derealized be being and uh, fantasy is uh, uh, unrealized being. Um, and so the there's something that happens in being is what I was trying to think of as what fantasy does. Um, and that in and of itself is going to be, it's mundane and it's quotidian because it's it actually isn't a transformation of the world and like that or not, not a transformation of the world even by a long sort of process of you know building a revolution the way that Fanon says like sort of eternal revolution. Um, but it's something that I thought was important to give an account of. Um, so that I guess that's one way I would I would think about answering that question. Well, you know, maybe towards uh wrapping up to a conclusion, um I would love to just ask everybody just generally, um, you know, what does fantasy mean to you now? You know, at the end of this conversation, at the end of looking at Derek's book, like where does fantasy sit for you in your thought process as a scholar, as a reader of these texts? Like what does the term now mean? I mean, I guess just to follow up maybe in, in thinking about the, that question, you know, I'm teaching a class in feminist and queer media studies this semester. And um, one thing is we go through various forms of, you know, genres and media that have been dismissed because of largely sort of identity specific responses, like, you know, romance novels and 
comics and you know melodrama and all these sort of like you know bad affective forms you know but then people say oh but here are the ways in which they're po political um and this sort of divide between like the fantasy and the real i mean i feel that i am often trying to push people to think about the ways um about what fantasy is not like this idea of fantasy as always escapism is problematic obviously um even though i often think of this line with octavia butler and the thing was parable of towns like what's the sort of what's wrong with the escape or like if it has you it has you and you have sort of no choice but to go there like it's a um that there's people in variety of things that we consume or you know just inhabit the everyday, we think about things that are not, you know, tactile and real, you know, in certain ways, right? And yet we may be watching things that have been made or reading things that have been made. Like there's so there, these things are real, but not real in the ways in which people are sort of conceptualizing them. And so, um, and yet black people also um are, you know, there's all this fantasy attached, all these things that are unreal attached to blackness, right? So we're just constantly negotiating a realm. Um, of the fantasy that sort of shapes our everyday. And so I think that that's what I try to get people to think about in terms of how we conceptualize um, what fantasy actually is in our lives. It's not something that's just sort of out there and that people go to and should need to come back, that we're constantly negotiating it, um, um, the good and the bad and the ambivalent and the everything. I mean, when I'm when I'm teaching, I'm always trying to communicate to people that fantasy is is closer than we want to admit, and um, to make a reference to our former president. Um, I mean, it's it's incredible that people are living this consensual fantasy that that person was a great statesman, right? And you know, had answers and was you know, it's just like what so it's like in. I feel like, oh God, I don't have to ever make that argument again, right? The argument that fantasy is just over there. It's like, no, fantasy is right here, right? And that if you wanna understand, you know, how to change the world, you, in part, you have to understand how to change fantasy. So I would talk, so I used to talk about, you know, the, the, the persistence in fantasy, like fantasy like Lord of the Rings and Harry Potter and such of like white male protagonists. It's like, why do these forms always have to reinscribe a sort of white masculinity when that's not necessarily reality? But now it's like, oh no, the fantasy is the Republican party. And so for me, like we're living alongside an interesting consensual fantasy, right? So it's, it's, it's just right there. And if we want to like make a more just world, we have to be able to, you know, recognize and address what's going on with that fantasy. Yeah, I think that's really quite beautifully put. Um, I would, you know, in a certain sense, I think reading Derek's book has led me to think in many ways about the relationship between uh, thinking about fantasy in the terms set out in this text and the sort of older models of what we would have called, uh, for lack of a better term, or, or explicitly call ideology. Right. And the traditional sort of Marxist understanding of ideology is to, you know, it's an imaginary resolution, a relationship to reality or an imaginary relationship to real contradictions. And one of the things that I think Jonathan points out quite well is that increasingly that imaginary relationship is not to a kind of set of real contradictions, but to still other fantasies and other uh, delusions, right? That that QAnon or just what it is to be a Trumpian member of the Republican Party is not to have an imaginary relationship to reality, but an imaginary relationship to a set, a whole other regime of fantasies. So in a certain sense, ideology has lost its mooring to anything meaningfully understood as reality or political consensus or anything of the kind. And this is, I think, what we have to understand as the coming of fascism, of a world in which um, the reality as we know it is being smashed by uh, the this, this simple, the, the profound power of fantasy to just d obscure, deny, um, and deflect uh, anything that the rest of us might recognize as reality. And and I'm I'm putting this, these are the really negative terms of it. And I think Derek offers us something that is far more hopeful, far more possible. And so in that sense, I not only come away with it with a critique of the kind of fascist ideology that or fascist fantasy that swims around us, but the need for us to fantasize on our own terms, that fantasy um, for 
uh, for all of us becomes increasingly a necessity and that a future, a, 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 any vision of social change has to be animated by a vision of a future society. And while that might have previously be un, been best understood as having the right ideology or good politics, I think increasingly, thanks to Derek, we can think of it as an imperative or an ex, a call to fantasize. That's so beautifully said, all of those comments. Um, we're at time, but Derek, I wanted to be able to give you the last word uh, before we wrap up. It's been so wonderful to meet with everybody here in this space. Uh, I just want to thank all of you as panelists. I, I loved your comments. They're all so incisive and beautiful and uh, thought-provoking for me. So thank you for engaging with my work and for having such thoughtful responses to it. Thank you everybody for joining us. This was wonderful. And we'll see you in all other venues.